Hello and welcome to today's edition of Extraordinary Outcomes. I'm Shubhanjan Sarkar, your host and founder of Pitchling, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Today, we bring you the sixth installment of the eight-part limited series, Fixing the 5% Problem in B2B Sales. In this limited series, we bring you engaging discussions with experts from around the world on the elephant in the sales room, the abysmally low rate of conversion in B2B sales. Today, we speak with Bill McCormick, Chief Sales Officer at Social Sales Link, Paula White, President Side B Consultant, and Ben Pincus. We start the episode with Bill McCormick. Bill discovered the power of LinkedIn and social selling when he and his wife started their advertising specialty company over five years ago with only a handful of clients. He quickly became a student of social selling, having read Brian's The LinkedIn Sales Playbook and putting her teachings into practice and growing a successful social selling process. Bill, welcome to the Extraordinary Outcomes show and this special segment uh, where we talk about the elephant in the room, which is the 5% conversion problem. Where do you stand on this one? Well, I, I, I think numbers are numbers and, and probably from one industry to, to the next, they, they can change. They can maybe be a little higher, be a little lower. I'm sure if a company is putting out, you know, if the, if the, if the average is 5%, then how high can it be, uh, you know, but you're right. It, it's, it's not as high. It should be in double digits. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a business owner. I want my profit margin. I want my conversion rate to be over 50% if it can be. So, so I agree with you that, that they're, they're very low rates. I think what we can agree on is that, that where sales is heading is, in a very impersonal way right now and one that's focused on numbers more than it's focused on people and i think because what we're doing is we're seeing clients as a dollar sign we're seeing clients as, or prospects even as a dollar sign rather than seeing them as as people what brought us here how did we get here well i think that this has been 30 years in the making uh, and I think it Absolutely. began in the in the in the B two C world back in the '80s when when telemarketing became so so huge and these call centers, you know, and ba basically I should have said it really all comes with technology, right? Because the technology got to the point in the telecommunications industry where call centers could be activated, and now you had auto dialers and people reaching out. And, you know, I can remember when I was in the eighties, right after being married, the phone ringing right at dinner time, and it, because they knew you were going to be home. And so that translated then into the, into the business world where the business leaders thought, Hey, we can have call centers and they can call on businesses. And so that started. And then we got the, and then if you were an inside rep or an outside rep, you had cold calling to do, you know, you had so many dials to do a day. And back when I was in sales, the number was about for every hundred dials you did, you got about 10 answers. And out of those 10 answers and you set a meeting, you got one sale. So it was a 1% conversion. And, and, I, and then that stretched into the 2000s when email suddenly became the, the thing. And so now we went from a synchronous communication, two-way, somebody talking on the phone to someone else, now we've got this asynchronous way that we can communicate. We can just send our message out. It lands and somebody reads it and they react to it. And so I think that's where we're at right now. And, and technologies continue. So now you have the whole area of social media and websites and how do you drive traffic to your website? And, and oh, wow, we have LinkedIn. You know, I heard one, one of our clients describe LinkedIn as Google for business. And I, I think what the sales leaders of the world need to do, and especially sales reps that are being taught to do this, is that if you're only going to have 5% return, so you sent out 100 messages and you got five back that are positive, I wouldn't worry so much about the five positive you got back. I'd really worry about the 95 that never responded or blocked you or reported you to LinkedIn or deleted your email because they see you now. It, it affects your per, your 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 reputation um, bad. You know, Mark Hunter says in today's world, our reputation arrives way before we do. And so I, I think for sales leaders 
and even for sales reps, they have to start looking at how to fix this is by making our numbers less, but making our quality more. What, what we say at Social Sales Link is you need to slow down your outreach to speed up your outcome. And, and the way you do that is making sure when you're reaching out, whatever way you're reaching out, you're doing so with quality. Can you unpack for us what would be the right way to reach out? Well, so so we are, you know, my my LinkedIn profile, the first thing it says for my headline is authentic, authenticity over automation. And it's not that I don't believe in automation. We use some automation, but it comes to that synchronous and asynchronous communication. You know, Jeb Blunt talks about it in his, his book, Virtual Selling. S Asynchronous is one way. So you can use automation to convey information. So we use automation and email systems to send information, but we're also always providing extreme value. You're, you're never going to get just a pitch from us. You're going to get extreme value that, that even by reading our emails, you're, lear you're learning something, right? Then, but then when you're looking to build a relationship, you want a synchronous communication. You want it to go back and forth. You want to have a conversation. Here's the thing. We have to earn the right to have a sales conversation with someone. All right. And one of the ways we do that is we always have to keep in mind the ask offer ratio. All right. Keenan in his book, Gap Selling, talks about this, that there's always an ask offer ratio. If you're asking someone to read an email, you're asking them to, to look at your LinkedIn profile or read a message you sent or read a piece of content. We're asking them for their time, which is their most valuable possession. We have to make sure they get something in return that's of equal or lesser or, or more value than, than that. And there are typically three replies or responses to the ask offer ratio. The first is a, is a bait and switch. You know, mm -hmm. and what we say in social sales link is a, 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 a connection pit and pitch is a bait and switch. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes when you when you say, "Hey, come to my webinar, and you're going to get these five reasons of how to of how to do something, or five ways how to do something." But when you go to the webinar, it's 25 minutes of pitching whatever they're selling, and five minutes of oh, here are the five points. So you always want to. So this that's the first response. The second response to the ask offer ratio is, "Nah, it, it's neutral. It, it doesn't really provide me with anything. There might be some information there, but it's nothing I haven't learned before." The third response to the ask offer ratio is where we're going to live. We want it to be compelling. We want what we what we share with them to be compelling so that they kind of get that, you know, when you see a dog that hears a weird sound, they kind of tilt their head funny. Then they like, huh, I never heard of that before. And, and you know, there's five things when whenever we're sharing content that we, we want to have happen. First, we want to resonate with our audience. We want them when they're reading it, when they're consuming it, to go, wow, that's me. I, I, res I can relate to that. The second thing is we want to create curiosity. We want them to have that, that head tilt moment of, or that lean in where they're like, hey, I, I'm, wow, I've never heard this before. We want to teach them something new, get them thinking differently. In the end, we want more what we call more raised hands. We want them to go, hey, I've never thought of that before. Can you tell me more about it? And the way that we do this is, I said, slowing down your outreach. So what you're doing is you're, first of all, on LinkedIn, you're connecting with purpose. You're just not connecting with anybody and everyone. You're looking at somebody's profile to see, hey, is this someone that I want to have as part of my network? Do they want me to be a part of their network? And if you can't find a reason, then follow them. Look at their content, engage with them on their content, give them a reason to connect with you. This isn't hard, it's just not easy. See, and, and the reason is, is because we've been taught in the sales world that, that there, there are plug and play solutions, that all you have to do is set up and segment your list the right way and send this, this, these five steps of, of email sequences and it's gonna convert to 50% and you're going to have much success and you're going to be able to sit back and, and because we want it easy. We don't want to do the hard work, the more difficult way of actually building a relationship and establishing a customer for life. Yeah. And also because, uh, because most of the sales automation, to my mind, drives the idea of making selling easy. But the fact is, making selling easy does not sell a thing. It can 
if you can make buying easy and all that you said actually makes the buying easy exactly. buying easy can end up in a sale but selling easy it is a very industrial era thought process which we are not able to shake off uh, where we were mass manufacturing we just figured out to mass manufacture stuff and we had to give a sales guy a quota saying you need to sell you know 100000 of pieces of this just figure out this is your territory go and sell it to whoever and and if you meet it you make so much money right so we are not able to sort of shake out the structure we had put 50 years back or 60 years back and we are our thinking is still uh, like we like we said you need lot more calls for your 5% so okay why mm-hmm. don't we do robo calling right Right, right. Oh, and and you said it. You you said the difference between being seller centric and buyer centric. And I think I think what's happened is we've developed all this sales training being seller centric rather than developing the skills necessary to make the buying process buyer centric. And and I if if people are in sales, I would highly recommend they read the book Selling from the Heart by Larry Levine because he talks about all of the soft skills that we need to really serve our clients the soft skills like really actually caring and having empathy for them to really developing relationships to actively listening and hearing what they're saying not listening to respond or to react but listening to be able to serve but it takes a lot of bravery to be able to do that in today's world and i say bravery because it could be their job on the line i i'm in a sales mastermind where some people are using some of these soft skills and they're actually threatened they're actually made fun of in the office they're looked down upon but you know what they're always at the top of the leaderboard in the month for their sales because their process their sales process is buyer centric it's not seller centric and and i'm part of the social of the um selling from the heart community and and what what we're trying to do and I'm going to say that but what Larry Levine and Daryl Amy from Selling from the Heart are trying to do is create this new way of selling that is more buyer focused and buyer centric that's where my heart hopes and wishes that we go to i think it's going to take some time to to get there well that's a wonderful note to end this chat but uh, as i am telling most of my guests i think this is not a topic we can finish off in one session of 30 minutes and we need to chat more uh, i really enjoyed talking to you and i i hope uh, you had a good time very good shivanj and thank you so much i i had a blast and i'd be happy to come back again uh thank all your listeners for listening tell them to connect with me on linkedin please would love sure. to to know that they listen to me here so thanks again Next up is Paula White, globally recognized sales leader focused on shifting perspective through music. She excels in scaling inside sales teams into multi-million dollar stand alone sales channels. Her passion for inside sales has gained her experience in a variety of industries: travel and tourism, investments, veterinary and healthcare distribution. Paula currently serves as a member of the AAISP advisory board and previously honored as a top 25 most influential sales leader recipient for three consecutive years by AAISP. Paula was the award winner of excellence in execution in 2017. She is listed in Ambitions top 100 coaches to watch for two consecutive years 2017 and 18. Paula served as president of the AISP Columbus Ohio chapter from 2015 to 2018 and is currently a mentor for Girls Club. When not working, she is an avid concert goer. Let's meet Paula. Paula Welcome to the show. I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you for making time. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be a part of this. Let's dive right in, Paula. There is this elephant in the room which most of us who are in sales, in B2B sales, don't talk about or don't talk about enough, which is this abysmal lead to conversion ratio. What do you think brought us here? So, you know if you think about fixing that 5% problem that you're talking about we have to look at what brought us here and i think 
we have a opportunity to get back to the basics, to get back to being human and selling. And that's selling on the phone or via face-to-face or Zoom or any of those things that we are now with technology doing. I believe that most businesses, including myself when I was in corporate America, knew when an SDR or somebody was calling me to try to sell something. So it's very easy to say, I don't have time at this moment, or we're not interested, because there's a process to sales, and we're all doing that process, but we're not putting that human touch to it. And I think we need to go back to building relationships. Where is it that this disconnect started? How is this that the disconnect persists? And how is that finally contributing to very bad conversion? So in my opinion, in my opinion only, um, the more we grow into technology, and I love technology, the ease of use, the efficiencies, all of those things. But the more that we grow into it, the less that we are actually capturing human behavior and talking to people um, again. And that's where we really need to get back to. But it's easier to say no to a bot or no, I'm not going to do that or go to somebody else or my price is better with such and such that we're not only just discounting the customer, but now our margins have decreased and our sales have decreased because everything has become competitive in that bot transactional world, Um, which is good for some buyers, but it trickles down. So if you're going business to business, that business is going to have to trickle down because the consumer or another business is going to want better pricing and use their bot and they're going in and out of different businesses as well. So in, you know, in where I'm looking is AI is fantastic in some cases, but bringing that into the sales process can be damaging because it's a lot easier to say no to a computer than it is a human. But how can we take it from 5% to 10? That will be a 100% increase in, in our output, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that was one of the things that uh, I was working on um, and where at the business that I was in, and that's what I'm working on now, is increasing that to double-digit growth. Having double-digit growth in a company is amazing because what you're doing is not only taking market share, but you're retaining market share. So the solution for me and what I believe in getting back to that human is, one, that you that we all know that sales is a process, but we've got to be humanistic and differentiate ourselves from it, right? And we need to start with the relationship. Two is I believe that our SDR teams are really the ones going out and hunting for business and leads and bringing them back to our account managers and sales teams. Now, that's where the farming begins. So the SDR is really not just qualifying leads. They're doing much, much more. They're getting maybe the first or second buying experience, understanding the buyer's journey, and then giving it over to the account manager with the relationship of this is how the buyer wants to buy. And that's the third thing is how does our how do our buyers want to buy? Do they want to buy by email, text, phone, or by a bot? We really need to understand that. So those are the three things that I would look for in our solution. My question is that the person who is leading the sales team is that person he or she missing out on appreciating 
what needs to be done to to actually equip the SDR team, which is where it all starts, to be effective so that the account team or 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 anything that happens thereafter can be more effective and thereby have better outcomes. You're absolutely right. And I think that this is all changed with our COVID. And I think our leaders are starting to understand that that to be more efficient, to have the technology in front of people so that they can make those calls quicker or help them uncover new opportunities. Having that technology is important. It's very important that um, not only just a CRM, but if you're going to do SDRs, call recording, call coaching, you know, if you're going to continue down that path, then having um, automated emails. I'm not big on sequencing, which is one thing that a lot of um, SDRs te- SDR teams use. And the reason that I'm not is because it takes that human element out of it again. I know a sequenced email now. We, we as buyers and consumers already know what's happening to us. So the technology has gone almost too far. It needs to be dialed back down a little bit. You know, again, the data is saying that buyers are increasingly refusing to get on a call with a salesperson because buyer is having his own journey. No matter what we think about the journey we prescribe for the buyer, the buyer has his own problems to solve, own team members to uh, uh, you know, convince, own budget allocation to ensure and so on and so forth. So he is having a completely different uh, chaotic time inside his organization. So he doesn't care about your thinking of IDA or the Bunt framework and whatever, right? So so he, he, he doesn't care. So the point is that the buyer is not really looking forward to picking up the phone and talking. How do you get through that? That's a challenge. That one right there is one we need to solve. And there are some different ways that you can do that. And one is differentiating yourself. I remember, um, and this was a long time ago, just sending a personalized note in handwriting to a customer so that when I called, he picked up the phone. It's just a matter of rehumanizing the sales process. We have gotten so technical on it and so analytical on it. And like you said, stage one, stage two, stage three. Talk to the customer until they're ready to buy. And how do we get them to pick up the phone? That is where we need, that is a good question. Um, And that's where I would love to see data and analytics because we don't know we have a problem until we've talked to somebody. But if we're not picking up the phone, we're not talking to somebody. And being able to differentiate ourselves needs to be something pretty impactful. There was a time 30 years back you were living in the same city all your life. You went to school with your friends who is now running a factory or, or working uh, in, in the Walmart there. And you are the salesperson. You possibly, your children play together. You coach their children or they coach your children. Trust is already there because you know each other for, for like, like all your life. The connection was already there. It was a pre-existing connection. But when I'm talking to you across the globe, with a 12 hour difference in our time and potentially never have met you to to, to build that trust is a a difficult process. That's exactly right. And I was going to say, you know, that trust thing is so important and I don't mean to call it a trust thing, but um, and being trustworthy And I think that that's where we need to be and look within ourselves. Are we being trustworthy? You know, 
I learned sales from my dad and my dad really believed in the handshake. You had a deal when you shook hands. And that's really the, the, to sum it right up. If you're shaking hands on it, you have the trust, you have the belief. Yes. And I think, I think the biggest challenge of humanizing the sales process again is right there because we yeah. have forgotten how to build trust and the fact that we have to be patient it's not an overnight or three call or a seven day exercise it's a much longer exercise you're you you are spot on you know i think it it is not a i'm in stage one stage two stage three you're never going to build trust that way you have to be a consultative seller somebody who is going to actually consult and be in the buyers or the other business being a partner with them but to be a partner with them you have to have the trust absolutely wonderful Paula thank you so much for your time I really enjoyed chatting with you this is great thank you let me know when it gets out there and uh, you know if if there's anything that I can do for you, please let me know. Absolutely. Finally, we meet Ben Pincus. With over 10 years of global sales and leadership experience, Ben's career focus has been helping teams, organizations, and brands sell and communicate more effectively and efficiently. His career stretches across multiple industries, including sports and entertainment, SaaS and consulting, and he has held positions with the Aspire Group as Director of Australian Operations and most recently as the Sales Strategy Practice Lead at Scaled Consulting. Ben, uh, welcome to the show. This is uh, a series that we are doing for uh, our show in the Sales Experts channel. Uh, extraordinary outcomes and this is this elephant in the room that we in sales are refusing to talk about uh, which is the abysmal conversion rate that we are all facing yeah well first thanks for thanks for having me Spanjan. you know I uh, my name is Ben Pincus I'm the head of sales at scaled consulting uh, we're based in Austin Texas but I'm talking today from from New York um, excited to be here I, I think this is a really relevant topic just whichever side you're you're on it so really looking forward to to the conversation today the basic question is Ben what got us here the the biggest issue that I see is the modernization of the sales process right you you talk about Gardner did a survey where where the overwhelming response I think it was people spend less than 20 percent of their time in the sales process actually dealing with a salesperson yes. it's like 33 percent of people said they didn't want to talk to a salesperson at all they just wanted to buy their thing and obviously for more complex decisions you never know um, but the problem is that we're still doing the the same type of sequence and cadence. There are some organizations that are using LinkedIn more effectively, but we're we're just the message isn't hitting the right place at the right time in the right way. And so I think people are we're trying to sell somebody right away, and we're using things that are only valuable to us. We're telling the buyer this is what we do. This is you know the the result that we got from this other client right away. Right? We're we're not doing exactly. We're not showing that we understand their business. We're not showing that we understand their goals or their industry, but we want to make sure that ultimately what we're trying to do is drive people back into the, into the buying cycle. And so you either have a breakdown where you have a marketer who wants to put out great content, but isn't thinking about the end result, or you have a sales team who doesn't really care what marketing's doing and is working in a silo. The second thing is you don't have the right cadence sequence at play, right? You're using the same, all right, call on Monday, email on Tuesday, call again on Wednesday and Thursday. And one, the biggest thing, one of the things we're doing with a lot of our clients is a digital strategy that, especially in the B2B space, relies on LinkedIn. And it's not exactly as you were saying, send a connection to somebody and then send them a direct message saying, hey, do you want to buy this thing? 
or even worse, send them an email saying, hey, do you want to buy this thing? Right. Again, going back to adding value, give, give, give before you ask. And so the way that the way that we teach and the way that you know we talk about this is connect with someone, engage with the content that they put out on LinkedIn, create content yourself that it des- is designed for the people that are going to buy from you, not to tell them, hey, here's this thing that I do. It's if you're a leader in this industry, here are things you should be thinking about. Show that you understand what they're going through. And so that by the time you really send that direct message, ask for that meeting, you know, they already know who you are. They already have a little bit of understanding. And as I was saying earlier, they've already done their research on you anyway, but they've done it in a way that you've controlled a little bit. Um, and then the, the, the third one I would say is most organizations have some sort of tech stack but they don't have a plan for how to use it. Like we need a sequencing tool, so let's buy this. Great, we need a CRM, let's buy this. But there's no strategy to think about how they're working together. We're gonna do this and it's gonna map to this part of the sales process. And that going all the way down to being documented for the team. So I know if I'm reaching out, I need to use this tool. If we get to the second stage, if X happens, then Y needs to happen. There isn't that strategy because if we are looking at the modern approach, We need to be using our own technology to serve the buyer. We're not following up. It's like if in 72 hours or a week or two weeks, we haven't gotten exactly what we wanted, we haven't gotten that meeting, all right, just move away. We don't have that nurture process. We don't have that focus on, okay, you know, they didn't respond to anything. So here's how we're gonna retarget. Or they responded to this, but we just, we didn't get that meeting. So we're gonna retarget in a different way, right? So it's like, all right, we had this campaign, it ran for three weeks or a month or two weeks. These people said no, we moved them out of the campaign and then you know we'll, we'll put them in our database and they'll get email blasts once a month. You create campaigns to grow your network, to grow the amount of people who are seeing what you're doing, right? We have, we have clients who have sales cycles of 18 months, right? If you go in with that first, like, hey, let's have a meeting, let's start buying this thing, it's, it's just not gonna work. And so, one of the things that, that we do is, it, again, I'll just use LinkedIn as an example. We're on a campaign on LinkedIn that is designed to do two things, build the audience and curate content for your ICP. So the first thing, most people on LinkedIn, their, um, their connections are full of former coworkers and you know friends, things like that. They're not, once they get into a new job, they're not connecting with their ICP on a regular basis, right? So when you're, even if you are putting content out, people who are seeing it aren't the people who need to see it. And so you use Sales Navigator. If you're in the B2B space and you don't have Sales Navigator, it's like 75 bucks a month. It's a huge miss. But you go and you create lists of your ICP. You multi-thread. So you've got, you know, three or four different touch points in your target accounts. And you've got, um, you, you connect with as many of those people as possible, Right. That way, when you do the second part, which is curating content for them, this is not about this is who we are, this is what we do. As I was saying, it's, you know, Saban Jen, here is what, if you're a leader in the SaaS space, in marketing technology, in fintech, here are the three things you should be thinking about in order to go through a technology transformation. Right. It has nothing to do about what we do, it has nothing to do about how much it costs or the services we provide. It's about what you should be thinking about. And when you do that once a week, twice a week, three times a week, over time, people see you as a thought leader. People see you as someone who can help them. And so I don't need to tell you, hey, here's what we do. Do you want to set up a meeting? Right. I'm telling you, I know about your space. I know what's important to you. I understand how to solve your problems so that A week later, when I send that first message, that's like, hey, no X, Y, Z about your company, thought it might be a good idea for for us to connect on this thing. When they start to engage on your profile or your um, content, you do the same with them. The relationship is there and it's not designed to close a sale in the first week. What is a decent duration of engagement before one can ask for a meeting to see if there is interest in what we are actually selling? There's no one answer to that, right? Because if we are, if we're using that LinkedIn 
play where we're you know, we're we're sending we're engaging with them or we're adding value five days three days depending on um if someone downloads a piece of content on our website probably going to be you know a bit longer of a play if we see someone is on our website you know clicking around downloading content day after day after day it's a shorter it's a shorter version so i think the answer to your question is you've got to be tracking what's most important, right? Going back to the tools piece, if you don't have some type of lead scoring system, if you don't have a clear buyer persona and ICP, um, it's you're not going to know. You're going to do the same thing for everyone, and that can't be the case anymore. What can we do to change, say, for starters, take it from the single digit to a double digit conversion? I think that would be a decent uh, target to have for any organization. So I know I've mentioned it a, a few times, but for me, it's it's two things. The first one is have a really clear picture of who we are selling to and who is buying. So there, there is actually a difference there, right? A lot of times we're like the CEO is signing the check, so she's the one who I need to go after and I just need to make sure the VP is on board. What we really need to do a better job of is speak to people in a way that matters to them. What matters to the CEO is not the same thing that matters to the VP of sales or the VP of marketing, is not the same thing that matters to the director, is not what matters to the end user, right? And so if we don't have messaging and value propositions designed for at least those first two, maybe three, it's, go it's going to be harder to convert and we're only gonna convert the people who are going to relate to that. Whereas if we're talking to a CEO saying, hey, this is going to save you a ton of money because of efficiencies. And we're talking to the VP of sales saying, hey, this is going to make your reps more targeted. We're going to talk to the director saying, hey, your reps are going to hit quota three months earlier by doing X, Y, and Z. You give yourself more of a shot. Um, and the second thing, as I mentioned a few times, is lead with value. Lead, lead, lead with value. And I don't mean our value proposition. I mean, what should they be thinking about? What do we know that's going on in their industry, in their company, with their competitors that we think would be of value to them? Before we ask for a meeting, before we tell them what we can do to fix it, it's here's what's going on in your industry. If you're in this space, here's value, here's advice, here's results, here's data. But if you don't have that deeper level of insight into are they growing? If they're Series B, what was their funding? Who are they funded by? Are they a first-time founder? What are the problems that they that are normally seen in their particular space? Right, if you're selling in the enterprise space and you have a well-established company, what new problems are coming up? If you don't have that deeper level of insight, yeah, you're not going to differentiate yourself. But I promise you, very few companies are taking that extra step to do what needs to be done to actually show the prospective client that I know your business. I've taken the time to understand how I can help, not just saying I have a solution and I know that this, we have clients in your space, sending a blanket case study, sending a white paper, but based on research that you've done, um, that's what it takes now. You can't, you can't do what used to be done because everyone's doing that. Interesting, so whose responsibility is really it is? I mean, is it, is it the SDR who is the newest member of the team who is expected to do this or is it is it a company leadership level issue? Um, I think it's a mix, right? I, I think if you tell an SDR, go prospect, go do research, that's not really setting them up for success. So it's it's on the SDR to do that work, absolutely. But it's also on the SDR manager to make sure that they're coaching to what prospecting verse, versus research actually looks like. It's on the AE to make sure that when they go into that call, they have another level of insight and research. So it's on the SDR, it's on the SDR manager, it's on the AE. And yeah, exactly as you said, it's certainly on leadership for that to be something that they push, that they talk about, that they do themselves. And then the last part about it is any support, sales ops, sales enablement, sales tools should drive that. If you have Hoover's or Zoom Info, are you just getting 
names and and funding levels and, and like the basic stuff? Or are you really digging in and looking at articles and getting quotes and seeing what their competitors are doing and, and all of those things that needs to be um, that should be mandatory the same way that we're tracking call numbers still, which is crazy um, and touch points. We should be tracking insights. You know, what we see is because, as I said, we do a lot of the things that I've mentioned today. We do have a tool that helps us score in real time. We do have a tool that helps us from a sequencing and cadencing standpoint. We do have the focus on this person might have the right title, but they're not in our ICP. This person might be in our ICP, but they're not at the right stage, whatever those things might be. Great. Thanks, Ben. This was great. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the chat. Uh, I yeah. definitely did. Yeah, so Jen, thank you so much for, for having me. This was great. And um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see these. And I know there's quite a few people that you you brought into this conversation. So excited to see the, the different viewpoints. And, and uh, hopefully we're going to solve, solve the 5% problem. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Tune in next week to meet Brad Javans, Principal Consultant, SA Partners, Michelle Bichamp, CEO of the Champ Group, and Amit Agarwal, SVP and Head APAC MEA at Algonomy to get a peek into what they're thinking about this elephant in the sales room. Our traditional management systems in sales have been very much about measuring, rewarding, recognizing, driving the individual. And it has been largely results-based, focused on lag measures. You know, your job's to get sales, go get sales. Why aren't you getting sales? You need to go get sales, get out there and get sales, make more calls, do whatever you got to do. And I think that pure management approach of really just driving the result and driving the individual, I think it's reduced the amount of innovation that can happen within the sales departments because it's people coming together and working as a team that actually leads to innovation to me, a lot of times it's consistency, right? I mean, I think that it, it's you, you, you really every single week have to just have such a mindset that it's new opportunity. <laughs> it's Monday morning, so it's new opportunity. That's a mindset. So, you know, are you leading your team to have new opportunity mindset or are you leading them to say, oh my goodness, how am I going to get that CRM? How am I going to get those leads this week? Right. Cause that's going to, that's going to determine a lot is what's the mindset, but it's the consistency. I mean, you know, and I recently saw statistic 44% of people give up after the first follow-up. That's, that's a big problem. From my experience, one of the things which I have done is what we call as uh, board deck, which I was explaining that every deal which has to be submitted, the pre-sales and sales team have to create this and they have to present it to me, which is why does the client need this solution? Why does the client need it now? And why does the client need it from this company, my company? Okay? And more often, not just by seeing this, just by seeing this, you know, myself or any, in fact, if you are seeing it as also any business leader will be able to say that, do you have uh, anything concrete to be of value to the customer because if we can't do this in good good in that board deck what will we do in the client presentation i'm very excited about this series my guests were super engaged and i can't wait to hear from you what do you think about this elephant in the sales room please use the link below to record your views in video and we will showcase them into the show in our upcoming episodes Time to wrap up for today. Remember, you will soon have access to the complete interviews and transcripts. Keep an eye out for the link in the EXO newsletter. And thank you for watching. Until next time, stay well and craft extraordinary outcomes.